أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلاق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك وأناخت برحلك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم إن في ذلك لآيات للعالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم This year year 2020, the year of wonders, the United States of America witnessed a very heinous crime. The entire world was watching. And that crime was that an individual, a black individual, George Floyd, was killed in a very monstrous way, in a very barbaric way. Why? Was he a, a mass killer? Was he a serial killer? Was he a terrorist? No. He was killed for a misdemeanor, for a misdemeanor, if it's considered a misdemeanor, over $20. But the actual reason for his death in that gruesome way, that suffocation, that he had to endure was because he's black, was because of the color of his skin. If it was someone who was white, if he was white, he would not have suffoc suffocated in the way that he did. He would not have been shouting in the last moments of his life, I cannot breathe. But because of his skin color, we saw what happened to him. And the entire world saw, and the entire world became a witness to this atro atrocious crime. This is a, a pattern in a series of racial discrimination that we've seen in the United States of America. This is not new, unfortunately to say. This is not new to the United States of America. The world was outraged. There were riots that were inspired all across America during the pandemic. Regardless of the pandemic, people took this to the streets to revolt, to riot, to speak out against racial oppression and racial discrimination, to speak out against the oppression against black lives. Black lives do matter just as White lives matter. This should not have taken place. Not in this time, not in this age, when people are supposedly educated, now that we should know about racial discrimination. We should know that all humans are created equally, as it states in the U.S. Constitution. Yet racial discrimination has become part of American history. From the moment that Columbus landed his ship, when Columbus arrived to America, to the Americas, from that day till today, there's been racial discrimination. What happened to the indigenous people of America? 
What happened to the Native Americans? How were they massacred? How were they treated? How were their lands and spaces taken away from them and their homes destroyed? Why? If they were blonde, blue-eyed individuals, would this have happened to them? No. But because of their skin color and because of their culture, they were seen as inferior to the white race. They were seen as subordinate to the white race. Thus, they were wiped out. And there were massacres. If you read about American history, we will, we will read about atrocious tragedies that took place against the Native Americans. And then, the history of slavery in America. Black slaves that were brought, imported from Africa. They were brought to America to work on fields, to work as slave farmers. The history of America is, is full of these things, is full of these scenes. Slavery has become a major part of American history. How blacks were treated, how black slaves were treated. Until the Civil War, until the emancipation, until black slaves were freed and slavery ended. And Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln, had a role in this. But he had to pay a major price. He had to pay. There was a cost for freedom. And Lincoln paid for this cost through his life. He was assassinated. For what reason other than to bring equality to black Americans and to end slavery? Did it end with his death? Did it end with the Civil War and the emancipation of black slaves? No. Blacks in America were still treated unfairly. It was black segregation. There were black schools and white schools. Black people couldn't attend schools that white people attended. In the bus, they would sit in the back. There were, e there were even water fountains. Water fountains for black people. And there were other water fountains for white people. They couldn't, say, they couldn't sit next to each other on the bus. This is part of American history. They didn't have the right to vote. Until just until the past decades, less than a century ago, or almost a century ago, where black people were allowed to vote. This is all part of American history. We saw in America black civil rights leaders that had to speak out and fight for their rights. Here in America, we have an entire month dedicated to Black History Month, to Black History. And that is the month of February, where we have to remind ourselves of the atrocities, of the oppression, of the injustice that took place against Blacks in America. And, and February has to be celebrated as such, because we will forget. We human beings, we forget of the tragedies that we and our forefathers and the generations before us committed. We have to remind ourselves, why? So that it would never happen again. Because if we allow it to, it would happen again against the black race. Black civil rights leaders who fought very bravely for their rights. Harriet Tubman, that fa famous heroine that became a, a national hero <coughs> or heroine rather who fought for the rights of black Americans Martin Luther King who had a dream I'm sure that today if Martin Luther King was alive he would be very disappointed at the state of what has happened how black Americans are being treated unfairly and unjustly. Malcolm X, who fought for the rights of black Americans. 
and for and called for the equality between races and between colors yet these people had to sacrifice their lives they paid an ultimate life uh, they paid an ultimate price and that was their life like malcolm x he became a martyr for speaking the truth for fighting for their rights it's becoming part of american history the kkk movement till today it exists and their hatred for the black race and for black americans this is part of the culture this is part of the it's an ideology that exists firmly till today and it's very widespread all across america in fact all across the west this racism against blacks i remember in 1992 i was young i was only 10 years old but i remember what happened with the rodney king case how he was beaten harshly by the five police officers in Los Angeles. I remember the Rodney King riots and protests that took the streets of Los Angeles. Maybe some of my dear viewers are too young to remember or perhaps were not even born at that time. But I remember vividly what happened to Rodney King and the riots that followed. It's not minor issues. It's not minor events here or there. It's become part of it's become a culture. It's become an ideology. The hatred against blacks, to see them as inferiors, to see them as subordinate. There are some, till today, they say that black communities, there's crime among blacks. There's miseducation. There's lack of education among blacks. There's uh, unemployment against blacks. Is this their fault? Were they treated equally for them to have more employment as the white communities? Were they offered jobs like the white communities were offered? Were they given privileges as the white community was to go to school, to get accepted at colleges and universities, to receive higher education? Were they given the same chan chances and opportunities that other communities received, like the white community, for them not to have crime rights? Of course, when you oppress a community so bad, when you beat them so bad, when you batter them, you don't provide them with education, you, you don't provide them with jobs, you don't provide them with services, community services. Of course, there's gonna be crime rights. There'll, there'll be crime rights in any community that is battered and oppressed, and there's discrimination and prejudice against that community any community you oppress them and you forbid them from seeking education and there's a bias against them of course there's going to be violence and crimes this is not their fault this is the fault of those who have oppressed them for so many years and have been biased against them for so many years this injustice has to end so the question is Will America continue to have racial discrimination against blacks and against all other minorities, Asians, Arabs, Chinese, Japanese, Mexicans, Hispanics? Will this racial discrimination ever come to end in America and in the West generally, or will it continue? So far, we see that it's become a, a culture, an ideology. It's not an incident, a, an isolated incident where it won't repeat. The case of George Floyd was not uh, the person who killed him, the police officer who killed him, is not a lone wolf where it's a minor issue that could be taken care of and there's no fear of it happening again. No. If it's an ideology, if it's a culture, it could happen again and again and again. Because it's an ideology. It's a mentality. It's a culture of feeling superior to blacks and feeling sentiments of 
feelings, a feeling that blacks are inferior to you, subordinate to you, that they don't deserve the rights that you deserve. This is a problem. This is a problem. And hence, racism will not end in America so soon. It's not going to end overnight. It will require lots of work. It will require a change of culture. It will require a change of ideology. It will require a lot of education. A lot of awareness. The rights that we see and protests that we see in America, this is good if it creates awareness in the minds of people. Otherwise, racism will continue. Unfortunately. And on top of that, on top of that, we have a racist president. A president that was elected on the foundation of racism. A racist president elected by racist citizens. Look at his ideology. Look at his way of thinking. He lives off of racism. Racism against Mexicans, let's build the wall. Racist against the Chinese, he calls the coronavirus the Chinese virus. Racist against Muslims, the Muslim ban, let's not allow Muslims to come in. Racist against blacks, racist against Hispanics. We all remember how he said rapists and drug dealers from, his, from the Hispanic community. It's as if there's no, there's no drug dealers and criminals in other communities or in the white community. This is targeting of specific races and nationalities. And this, is not what, this is not what the U.S. Constitution talks about. It's something that the U.S. President talks about, but not the U.S. Constitution. He fuels racism. So when you have a culture like this, and when you have an ideology like this, and when you have a racist president that is fueling racism and hatred, you cannot expect racism to be eradicated overnight and to leave overnight. This is a problem. We Muslims, we, our constitution, our religious constitution is the Qur'an. Let's look at what the Quran says regarding racism, about race, about nationality. What does Allah say in the Quran about mankind and humankind and their various nationalities and races and tongues and, and languages? First of all, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored mankind, period, full stop. Mankind have been honored by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Whether you're white or black, you're Hispanic, you're Arab, you're Chinese, you're Japanese, you're Indian, you're African, whatever language it is that, that you speak, whatever color that your skin color is, that your skin is, regardless. We have honored all human beings. وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا We have favored human beings over all of God's creation. Man is the best of God's creation and he's been favored on top of all creation. All man, all mankind, all humankind, regardless of race, regardless of language, regardless of, of color. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Qur'an that He has created us into tribes and nationalities, into nations and tribes. He's telling us that your differences in color and in nationality and in language, this is because of me. I created you in this fashion. We created you from a man and a woman, meaning Adam and Eve. And we made you into tribes and nations. We made you into nations and tribes rather. Shu'uban means nations. Waqabail means tribes. We made you into nations. 
We made some of you African. We made some of you Arab. We made some of you Chinese. We made some of you European, Spanish, English, Indian, Pakistani, and so on and so forth. We created these nations. We made you into different nationalities and different tribes. Why? لِتَعَارَفُ So that you may meet one another. So that you may get to know one another. So that you may understand one another. So that you may learn from one another and grow with each other. Different races, different nationalities, different groups, different tribes. This all means different experiences, different human experiences. A difference in education and knowledge, different experiences. Some of you are poor, some of you are rich, some of you are educated, some of you are not educated. Some of you live off of hunting, others live off of gathering. But you come together and you complete one another and you learn from one another. And you gain that human experience. You complete that human experience. لِتَعَارَفُ You learn from each other's experiences. You gain knowledge from different nationalities. What a, what a thought. What a goal. What an aim. You won't find this aim only in the Holy Quran. What a beautiful aim. That we're different. Allah purposely created us differently so that we grow together. We complete one another. Imagine if all human beings were the same. If we were all white and we we're all middle class and we all worked as the same. We all have the same job. Imagine how life would be boring and dull. In fact, we wouldn't be able to live. We're able to live because we think differently and we work differently. And we have various jobs, we have various positions, we have various duties and responsibilities. We have different minds, we have different cultures, we have different backgrounds. When all of these come together, when all of these cultures and, and backgrounds and experiences, they come together to work together, imagine what they could do together. Imagine where humans could be. If they respected one another and appreciated one another. I appreciate that culture and nationality for who they are, not for them wanting to be like me. There's no appreciation in that. I appreciate the Chinese, for example, because of their rich culture. And because of where they've reached and what they've achieved. And what we could do together. And I respect the African culture for what they've done and what they've achieved and their background and their history. And I accept and I appreciate. So it's not about acceptance. Acceptance, this is al iman. This is the weakest form of faith to accept one another. It's not about accepting one another. It's about appreciating one another. Do we appreciate this wide spectrum of colors, races, nationalities, tongues. Do we appreciate it? Because this is what makes us as human beings. This is the reason why we were created differently. Not just to accept one another, but to appreciate one another. To work together. I come with my background, my history. My experiences, my knowledge, I come, I come forward, and someone else comes with his history or her history, their background, their culture, their knowledge, and others come from all, all across the world, and we put our knowledge together to work together. Because that is how we will rise as human beings. That is how we will improve as human beings. That is how we will reach our full capacity and be human beings. By ignoring our differences, putting aside our differences, 
yet appreciating, appreciating those differences. Because all of those differences are not a sign of weakness, but they're a sign of power. They're positive, they're not negative. When we put them together and we appreciate one, one another and we complete one another, that's power. It's not weakness. إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَّرٍ أُنْتَ وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُ And then, which one of you is the best? Which one is the superior race? Who is the dominating race? Who has the upper hand? It's none of the colors, none of the nationalities, none of the languages. إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The most honorable amongst you in the eyes of God is the one who is most God-fearing. Who's the most righteous, the most righteous, God-fearing, religious. Those who do good to others. Those who benefit others. Those who do the best for mankind. Those who do good and provide good for mankind. They're the best. As for their lineage, as for their background, as for their race and color and nationality, that's besides the point. In the eyes of Allah, that doesn't matter. Allah teaches us to be colorblind. In this sort of aspect, it is good to be colorblind. Don't look at the color of the, of the person you're dealing with. Look at their achievements. Look at what they've done. Look at what they could possibly achieve. Look at what you could do together, how you could co cooperate together. This is the essence of Islam. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that among the signs among his signs is that he created us in different languages. We speak different languages. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ And from amongst his signs, خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The creation of the skies and the earth. وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكِ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ The differences in your languages and in your colors. This is a sign of God. Your different colors, your different languages. Some of you speak Arabic, some of you speak English, Farsi, Urdu, Gujarati, French, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, Japanese, all these various languages, all these various colors, all these various nationalities. They're a sign of God. Allah says, who else could have done this other than me? It's a sign of God. You look at a wide spectrum of colors and nationalities. The first thing that could that could that should cross our mind is to say, Subhanallah. This is we're all the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. And we're all children of the same two parents, Adam and Eve. All these various languages and colors and nationalities, they all came from the same origin, the same father and the same mother. But they were taken to various lands and countries. Due to seeking sustenance, some went to the north, some went to the south, some went to the east, some went to the west. Some became hunters, some became gatherers, some worked as farmers. Some worked as fishermen. Some worked into commerce. And so on and so forth. You became different. And each group that migrated to different parts of the world, they developed their own language, their own means of communication. And they developed their own culture. And they developed their own civilization. This is a sign of God's greatness. Why do we make this? A weakness, a sign of weakness. Why do we make this a reason for us to fight each other and kill one another and wage wars against one another? This is a sign of God's greatness. We should be appreciating one another. That is why Allah says, tells us, encourages us to travel. Travel. Go to various countries. Go and see what God created. In, this land, in his lands, go and visit 
different cultures and civilizations, appreciate them, learn about them, learn about their history, learn about their background. Appreciate one another. Appreciate what God has created. Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran condemns racism. The Arab during the Jahiliyyah, they were racist. They saw themselves as the superior race. As, as other races, there are several races, they see themselves as the superior race. The racist. The Arab during the Jahiliyyah, they were among the racist groups. They had racism. The Quran tells them, tells them this. The Quran says, we reveal the Quran to you in Arabic so that you may believe. And all other nationalities, they will believe with you. The Ajam, Persians, Indians, all other nationalities, they accepted the Quran. They believed in the Quran. They accepted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But if we were to, to reveal the Quran in another language, you Arab, during the days of Jah you Arab, would not have accepted the Quran. You would have been racist. You would not have accepted it. وَلَوْ نَزَّلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ بَعْضِ الْأَعْجَمِينَ فَقَرَأَهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ مُؤْمِنِينَ if we had revealed the Quran to non-Arab, A'jameen, anything that is non-Arabi is called A'jam. If we had revealed the Quran to, to a non-Arab, you would not have believed in it. You would not have accepted it because of racism. The Quran condemns racial discrimination and tells us that the first individual that discriminated and felt prejudice is Iblis. Iblis. Iblis refused to prostrate to Adam. Why? He said, I'm a, from a superior kind. And Adam is from an inferior kind. How can I prostrate to Adam when you've created him from clay and you've created me from fire? And clearly, fire is greater than clay. The first sign of prejudice we see was from Iblis and Allah condemns him and Allah kicked him out from paradise and kicked him out from his mercy. He was excommunicated because of this prejudice that he showed towards Adam and the children of, of Adam. The first bigot, the first prejudice was from Shaitan. Now here there's a misconception. Some say, but there is racism in the Quran. How? They say the Quran says that on the Day of Judgment, some faces will be white and other faces will be black. The good doers, their faces will be white, but the evil doers, their faces will be black. Why is it that evil doers, out of all the colors, why do their faces have to be black? Isn't this racist against black people? For the evil doers on the Day of Judgment, their faces to be black? The Quran says, يَوْمَ تَبْيَضُّ وُجُوهٌ وَتَسْوَدُّ وُجُوهُ فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ سْوَدَّتْ وُجُوهُهُمْ أَكَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ One day, on a day, meaning the Day of Judgment, some faces will become white, other faces will become black. Those that became black, we will ask them, did you disbelieve in what? Did you disbelieve? Then taste. Taste what you disbelieved in. فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابَ Taste punishment because of your disbelief. They say, see, there's discrimination in the Qur'an. There's racial prejudice in the Qur'an. But this misconception has clearly misunderstood the verse as has misunderstood the Qur'an. In the Arabic language, white, the white, the the widening of the face and blackening of the face. This is metaphoric. This is figurative. It is not literal. The Quran doesn't mean literally that some faces will be white and literally that some faces will be black. No. In the Arabic language, this is a usage and it has nothing to do with white people and black people. 
when someone is proud of what they've done, they've done something good, they say, my, my face is white. Wajhi abyad. Because I did this or I did that. Meaning, I have nothing to be embarrassed of. I have nothing to be ashamed of. Rather, I'm proud. So my face is white. And if someone is embarrassed, ashamed, he'll say, Wajhi aswad. My, my, my face is black. This has nothing to do with white or black people. White and black, black specifically, it's a symbol of sadness. It's a symbol of sadness. It's a universal symbol of sadness. It has nothing to do with black people. That is why anywhere across the world, when someone dies, their relatives wear black. Is that being racist? Because they wear black? No. Even black people themselves, if a relative dies, they wear black. It has nothing to do wearing black and the color black has nothing to do with the black race. A lot of places in the world, black is a symbol of sadness. If, a, if an atrocity takes place, if a tragedy takes place, they lift black flags or black banners. It's a sign of sadness. And it's also a sign of embarrassment, being embarrassed, being ashamed. It has nothing to do with the, the black race. When the Quran says, يَوْمَ تَبْيَضُّ وُجُوهٌ وَتَسْوَدُّ وُجُوهٌ Absolutely not. It's a sign of embarrassment. It's a sign of being ashamed. It has nothing to do with the black race. It could also be alluding to having light in their face. Those who did good, they have light in their face. Those who did not do good do not have light in their face. We know this because there's another verse that says, يَوْمَ تَرَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَسْعَى نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ On a day, on the day of judgment, you will see the believing men and women, their light precedes them. There's light coming out of them. Because good deeds, iman, faith, all of this translates into light. There's light ahead of them. So the black faces, it means, it could mean that they, they don't have light that spiritual light on the day of judgment so it has nothing to do with race and it has nothing to do with racial discrimination rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam from the beginning of his message till the end he spoke out against racial discrimination he made his companions equal and he would tell them that you are all equal in the eyes of allah white black you're all equal. He would say, "Inna Rabbakum wahid. Your Lord is, your God is one. Wa inna abakum wahid, and your Father is one. Wa dinakum wahid. Your faith is one. Wa nabiyyukum wahid, and your Prophet is one. La fadl li Arabiyyin ala ajami, wa la ajami ala Arabi, wa la ahmar ala aswad, wa la aswad ala ahmar. Allah bi taqwa. There's no superiority between an Arab and a non-Arab, a red." and a white alluding to different colors and different races there's no superiority among the races except in piety Who, whoever is most righteous and God fearing is superior is spiritually superior but not race not nationality and this was translated in his actions as well, and in the actions of the Ahlul Bayt, all of them, they spoke about equality among the races. Now, my dear friends, we as followers of Ahlul Bayt, we as followers of the Quran, we as followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, do we believe in racial equality? We do, but do we implement racial equality? Do we not have? racial discrimination in, in our communities? Unfortunately, we do. We do have racial discrimination. We say one thing, but we behave in another. Don't we, in some of our communities, we call black people abid? We call them abid? Is this not racially derogatory? Don't we make fun of different nationalities? Each race makes, makes fun of another race? Isn't there a tension between certain nationalities like Iraqis and Iranians? Don't we see tension 
sometimes between these two nationalities. Some Iraqis disliking Iranians and some Iranians disliking Iraqis. We see some Iraqis calling Iranians Ajam and some Iranians calling Iraqis Arab. Don't we see in some communities among the Iraqis they make fun of Kurds and there's Kurdish jokes. Or there's tension between the Afghan community and the Iranian community. And there's some Iranians that dislike Afghans, some Afghans that dislike Iranians. This exists in, in almost every culture, almost every nationality, almost every race. And I don't mean to pinpoint specific groups and target them, but I'm giving examples. There is, there is this racial discrimination, even amongst us. I've seen in some communities in the United States and in, in the West, generally speaking, when there's a white convert that converts to Islam, we get excited, we get happy. But when a, a black person comes to convert, convert to Islam, we're not so excited. We don't care. Why? Because he's black. Because he's not white. Of course, there's, this is in some communities, not all. But nevertheless, it exists. Some of our communities, we, we're not welcoming of black individuals at our centers and at and, and our mosques. We don't make them feel welcome. We don't make them feel at home. We don't treat them like we treat others of our own kind and of our nationalities. And if it comes to marriage, then unfortunately there's so much to complain about. If someone from a different race come, asks for our daughter's hand in marriage, someone not from us, that doesn't speak our language, that is not from our race and nationality. And if it's a black person, it's even worse the way we treat that person, the racial discrimination that we see. So where what, what happened to our slogans? What happened to our faith? What happened to our Quran? Why is it that we preach one thing and we practice something else? There's even racism in our mosques. We welcome certain groups and we don't welcome other groups. We welcome, the, we welcome people from our own nationality to our mosques and we make them feel welcome. But people from other nationalities, we don't make them feel welcome. In fact, we prefer that they don't come to our mosques. We're not welcoming. Do we welcome converts? Do we invite them to our homes during Ramadan when we invite people over for iftar or suhoor? Do we invite converts as well, white or black? Do we take care of them? Do we cater for them? Do we welcome them? These are all tough questions. And this year has been a tough year where we had to review ourselves. Review ourselves, especially with converts. Unfortunately, I've seen that sometimes we showcase them. When we have guests that come, we say, see, we have converts at our mosque. We have this person and that person. But how much do we really respect them? How much do we really welcome them? What role do we give them at the mosque? Do we put them on the boards? Do we allow them to speak? Do they have real roles at our mosques? Or are they showcased? Racial discrimination has to stop. And we Muslims, we cannot object at others if we ourselves have racial discrimination in our mosques and in our centers. Let's learn. Let's learn from the Ahlul Bayt. We have good examples for us. Look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How he treated Bilal. The Adhan, saying the Adhan was a great honor. It was a great honor. Today, I sometimes, you know, before the corona pandemic, when we'd go to the mosque, I would see some individuals when they're asked to say the adhan, they run away from it. They think that they're being disrespected when they're asked to say the adhan, especially the youth. They don't want to say the adhan. Well, this is an honor. Rasulullah gave this honor to Bilal al-Habashi. There were a lot of others that wanted this honor. Ya Rasulullah gave it to Bilal. And even after the conquest of Mecca, Rasulullah asked Bilal to stand on the Kaaba. Bilal stood on the Kaaba and he said the Adhan. 
there were some newly there was some new converts to Islam from the people of Quraysh from the people of Mecca one of them he said two friends they were speaking to one another one of them said Rasulullah and didn't find anyone other than this black crow to say the adhan very demeaning the other one said thank God that my father is dead because if he were alive today he would die from the sight of seeing Bilal al-Habashi on the Kaaba. Rasulullah had to fight this sort of culture this sort of mentality this sort of ideology he had to educate this sort of people and then after him, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, one of his closest companions was Maytham al-Tamar, a close companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen. A black, a slave, Amir al-Mu'mineen bought him, he educated him, and he became one of Amir al-Mu'mineen's closest companions. And in Ashura, in Karbala, we see Joan, Mawla Abi Dhar al-Ghifari, the companion of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. How Imam Hussein treated him how he gave him permission to fight and after joan falls on the ground how imam hussein rushed to him and prayed for him and put his cheeks on the cheeks of joan a gesture that he only did with his son ali al-akbar and he didn't do with anyone else imam hussein treated joan like he treated his son ali al-akbar this is the Ahlul Bayt. This is Islam. This is what we should learn from. This is what we should implement. On the eve of the 5th of Muharram, we remember Muslim ibn Aqil, the cousin and messenger of Imam Hussein, sent to Kufa. Muslim ibn Aqil was sent to Kufa by Imam Hussein to prepare the path for Imam Hussein's arrival to Kufa. Muslim ibn Aqil was greeted in a very wonderful fashion, yet Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad became the new governor of Kufa and he started to buy people, either to buy them with money or to scare them with the sword. Slowly, all those who had surrounded Muslim ibn Aqil and been his followers they, they slowly begin to disperse. One night, Muslim ibn Aqil prayed in Masjid al-Kufa. He prayed al-Maghrib. The Masjid was full. He looked behind him between Maghrib and Asha. The Masjid was half empty. Half of them left. When he finished al-Asha, three-fourths of the mosque was empty. By the time he reached the door of the mosque, the entire mosque was empty. They abandoned Muslim ibn Aqil. The people of Kufa abandoned Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim ibn Aqil walked in the streets of Kufa until he stopped at the doorstep of Taw'a, this righteous woman. She came out. She asked him, do you need anything? She did not recognize who he is. He said, bring me some water. She, bring, she brought him water. After he drank, she told him, Ya Abdullah, it is not proper for you to sit at my doorstep. Go to your family. Go to your tribe, go to your family. He said, I do not have a family. I do not have a tribe. She said, who are you? He said, I am Muslim ibn Aqil. I am Muslim ibn Aqil. I am the one who was betrayed by the people of Kufa. She welcomed him in, a, in her house. He spent that night praying and worshipping and supplicating until the son of Taw'a, who was part of the army of Ibn Ziyad, he gives news. To Ibn Ziyad that the person you're looking for isn't in our house. They come, they surround him, they fight with him until they dig a ditch or a trench, they, a trap. Muslim ibn Aqil falls in the trap. They bring him to the palace of Ibn Ziyad, drenched in his blood. He says, take him to the roof. They take Muslim ibn Aqil to the roof of the palace. And he's about to, it's the final moment in the life of Muslim. He asked, <coughs> he asked them to allow him to pray. He prays and then he asked for some water. As soon as he wanted to drink water, blood, the blood from his mouth and his lips is poured 
into the bucket. He asked for another bucket of water. Twice, three times, he was not able to drink water. Allah Azza wa Jal wanted the fate of Muslim ibn Aqil to be like the fate of Imam Hussein to die thirsty. Finally, moments before his death, he looked towards Medina and he said, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah, ya ibn Rasulillah, ghadara bi ahl al-Kufa. Peace be upon you, Ya Aba Abdullah. Do not come to Kufa. The people of Kufa have betrayed me. There were people that gathered around the palace, some loyal followers of Muslim, asking about Muslim. They were pleading. They were rioting, asking for Mus- Muslim. The guards told them, in, in a minute, Muslim will come out to you. Moments later, they saw a body, a headless body, fall from the roof of the palace, it was the body of Muslim ibn Aqil. They tied ropes around the feet of Mus- of Muslim and they began to drag him in Kufa. Imam Hussein salam was in Karbala when the news of the death of Muslim ibn Aqil reached him. It was the 8th of Muharram. Imam Hussein was in Karbala. They told him that your cousin Muslim ibn Aqil has has been martyred in Kufa. Imam Hussein alayhi salam begins to weave. He said, call me Hamida, the daughter of Muslim. She was in the caravan of Imam Hussein. They called Hamida. Imam Hussein alayhi salam held Hamida. He put her on his lap and he began to brush. He began to brush her head with his hands. Hamida looked to her uncle, Imam Hussein. She said, yeah, I'm, I see you treating me as you would treat orphans. Are you giving me bad news? Has something happened to my father, Muslim ibn Aqil? Imam Hussein began to weep. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalamu alladheena zalamu. Ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Nasaluka Allahumma wa nadu'uk. Bismika al-azim al-a'zam. Al-a'az al-ajal al-akram ya Allah. Allahumma la tad'a lana dhamban illa ghafarta. Wa la hamman illa farrajta. ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا خوفا إلا آمنته ولا رزقا إلا بسطته ولا شملا إلا جمعته ولا مرضا إلا شفيته ولا غائبا إلا حفظته وأدنيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Adam Allah, lakum al-aj, dear viewers of MYC and IIA. May Allah accept your amal tonight, who was a trusted, loyal uh, servant and advisor for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. His loyalty is unmatched. His name is Muslim ibn Aqil, who were uh, to gain support and give a report to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But unfortunately, the angel of death also arrived in Kufa. And the poet Nuri Sa'ad. Angel of death for me came. In Kufa he calls out my name. And if he returns my soul to my creator. I'm scared he'll then search for Hussein in Karbala. In Kufa he calls out my name. In Kufa he calls out my name. I am Muslim and I have a place. To gather support and topple the tyrant's reign. They wrote to us of this tyranny. They complain forbidden on us to from request. Of any who's trying
are going to stand Tell the angel of death I have a duty here I'm scared he'll then search for Hussein in Karbala He calls out my name He calls out my name Death went for any soul you call They answer you at your feet Even tyrants fall Whereas I'm left Now assistance left me there more And as a my head calamities before Seventy-one are with Hussein With me not even one With me not even one remains If the angel of death knows I've no supporter Scared he'll then search for Hussein In Karbala Echo fake calls out my name Echo fake calls out my name I walk alone No supporter From street to street The angel of death calls out Must make your death great I feel the clutch of failure on my heart beat because of me. Will Hussein face such defeat? An angel of death, let me stay for more support. I'll swear I'll pray. Oh, angel of death, let me stay For more support, I swear I'll pray For if this angel takes me to the hereafter I'm scared he'll then search for Hussein in Karbala Echo fake calls out my name Echo fake calls out my name it may be so that martyrdom I'm fated, but my reply, my master, her saints are waiting by the picture of a Hussein kill. I To Hussein I have a duty This shapes my content as mighty If I accept death My forty it shall wonder I'm scared he'll then search for Hussein In Karbala A Kofay calls out my name A Kofay calls out my name they tell me drink before we throw me to the ground Each time I sip in this cup my blood I fell I gaze to the Oh, saying the world as your cousin abandoned me, the angel.
angel of death knows What hardship throughout my blood flows No, it's not because death or martyrdom I fear I'm scared he'll then search for Hussein in Karbala I'm scared he'll then search for Hussein in Karbala Echo calls out my name Echo calls out my name And they tell me drink Before we throw you to the ground Each time I sit In this cup my I gaze to the land of death too, which Hussein's well. Oh, Hussein, the world has your cup in a bag. Opening in the angel of death knows what I achieve throughout my blood. Death knows what hardship throughout my blood flows. Only the angel of death knows what hardship throughout my blood flows. No, it's not because death or my fear. I'm scared he'll then search for Hussein in Calvada. Many thanks to the poets. Nuri Sardar, Assalamu alaikum. Ya Aba Abdullah, wa ala al arwah lati hallat bi fina'ik. Alaikum minni jami'an salam Allah badal ma baqit wa baqiya al layl wa al nahar. Wa la ja'alhu Allah akhir al ahdi minni li ziyaratikum. Assalamu ala al Hussein, wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein, wa ala awlaad al Hussein, wa ala ashab al Hussein, khususan Sayyidi wa Mawlai, Abil Fadl al Abbas, Mukhtar Zainab jami'an. ورحمة الله وبركاته